when we meditate, we're working with the process of perception. When we focus on the sensation of the breathing, we're also keeping in mind a particular perception of the breath so that we know what to look for, where to look for the breath. For example, if you have a perception of breath simply as air coming in and out of the lungs, you're going to be looking one place and seeing one kind of thing. If you change your perception, think of the breath as energy flow in the body, you're going to be looking someplace else and seeing other things. And perception is also used in gaining insight. Sometimes you hear that concentration basically deals with the perception or the mental label of something, whereas when you're developing insight you're dealing with the actual experience. But that's not the case. The two go together, the perception and the experience, both in concentration practice and in insight practice. When you're starting to develop a sense of dispassion, that perception of inconstancy or the perception of stress or the perception of not-self. These are mental labels, and you're applying them to things you're experiencing. And one of the important lessons you learn from, the, from meditation is the power of perception, how it can shape your experience what you sense in your world of experience, both inside the body and around you. Where you're going to focus your attention, what you're going to do with it, your sense of your possibilities, what can be done. Again, if you think of the breath simply as the air coming in and out of the lungs, there's a certain limited range of possibilities of what you can do. The idea of allowing the breath to stop gets kind of scary, but if you think of the breath energy flowing throughout the body, extending out to all the pores, then the idea of the in and out breath stopping is not so scary. If you think of yourself as starved of breath and you have to keep gulping it in, you're going to breathe in one way in a way that's not very conducive to getting the mind to settle down. But if you develop a perception of the body being filled with breath energy, then the in-breath is just connecting with what's already there, energizing what's already there. You're going to breathe in a different way, a lot less desperation, a greater sense of fullness and ease, what's called the bodily fabrication aspect in the out-breath has an impact on the movement of energy in the body, and the way you feel the body is going to get more and more subtle, and that's more conducive to the mind settling down. And all of these perceptions are true, it's just that some of them are more useful than others, more beneficial. And for the purpose of meditating, you want to hold on to a perception that's right for what you're doing right now. In this way, the perceptions you hold in the mind are kind of metal chatter, a kind of inner speech. And the same principle is applied to inner speech that the Buddha applies to outer speech. In other words, the first question is, is it true? There are all kinds of things that are true. So the next question is, is it beneficial? Is it really good to say these things? Is it really good to hold these perceptions? What use do they have? What impact do they have on the mind? And even though they may be true, if they're not having a beneficial impact on the mind, you want to let them go. But even if they're beneficial, then the next question is, is this the right time and place for them? Is this the time for comforting perceptions, or is this the time for the perceptions that crack the whip and say, hey, you've got to get to work? And that you learn through experience. But for the purposes of the meditation right now, you want to hold on to a perception of the breath that allows the mind to settle down, so it doesn't have to think a lot about 
breathing in, breathing out. Just allow the breath to come in, allow a breath to come out. So a perception of the, the ease of the breath, the fullness of the breath is very helpful. And at the same time, you need some useful perceptions about your own mind. You have to be convinced that you can do this. As the Buddha said, this is a form of conceit. You hear that other people can gain awakening, and you tell yourself, well, they're human beings, I'm a human being. They're, they can do it, so can I. But sometimes you're fighting some perceptions that you carry over from, from the past, which tend to undercut that kind of self-confidence. So again, it's a question, however true they may have been, are they beneficial right now? No. So you've got to figure out ways to let them go. And John Munn would do this with his students. He himself was the son of a peasant. Most of his students were peasant's sons. And peasants in Thailand are way down on the, the social ladder. And the message coming out of Bangkok was if you wanted to get anywhere in the Buddhist teachings, you had to go to Bangkok and study with the experts there in Bangkok, people from the royal family, people from educated backgrounds. And if you were just a peasant's son meditating out under the trees, what would you know? And a lot of these people had internalized that message. So the first task for John Munn was to counteract it. One of his frequent teachings was that, what do you need in order to practice? Well, you need a human birth. You've got that. You need 32 parts of the body. Sometimes you don't even have to have all 32 functioning properly. But you've got a human body. You've got a human mind. You've got what it takes. And you see that repeated again and again in his teachings. He had to build up the confidence of his students, and yes, even though they were peasants, may have had minimal education, but they had enough. They had what it takes. And this is why we have the forest tradition, because they were able to overcome the messages that society had been sending to them. Because you need confidence in order to do this. The one helpful perception is not, not of yourself as a unitary self, but think of yourself as many selves. You've had many desires. Each desire has its own set of selves, the, the self that's going to gain the pleasure that's desired, and then there's a self that's going to be able to manage things to produce that sense of pleasure. Now, in many areas of life we may not have many skills, in which case that second kind of self may be pretty undeveloped. But you have to think about the fact that you do have some skills. There are some things that you do well. And so think of those as the strong members of your committee. Then learn to apply the lessons they've learned in managing things skillfully to your meditation, because this is a skill that requires time, it requires patience. So we can comprehend suffering, we can let go of its cause, develop the path so that we can experience or verify for ourselves that there is a cessation to suffering. And the hard part there is comprehending the pain, because the pain, both of physical pain and of emotional pain, is something we tend to run away from. Who wants to sit around with pain long enough so you can comprehend it? So you need skills. You need strengthening factors. This is what the path is all about, from right view all the way down to right concentration. The factors of the path are there to strengthen you, to encourage you, to give you the skills that you need in order to be able to sit with suffering, sit with pain, and understand it. So again, whatever perceptions, whatever ways of talking to yourself are true, but may not be beneficial or may not be timely, you've got to learn how to drop them. 
Sometimes we have a big investment in them. Sometimes it's something that's been drummed into our heads so long that we can't think of any other alternative. So that's when you've got to remember you do have skills, you do have abilities. Focus on those. Build on your strengths. Again, don't perceive yourself just as a unitary being. You've got all these committee members in here. And try to figure out which ones are skillful, which ones are going to be helpful right now, and encourage them. So that you have the strength to look at your suffering. This is why we work so much on concentration, because the concentration develops a sense of ease, it develops a sense of rapture, it develops a sense of stability that's nourishing for the mind, strengthening for the mind. And then there are all the other forms of concentration. Meditation exercises that can be helpful. Reflection on your own generosity, reflection on your own virtue. Recollection of the Sangha, remembering all those monks and nuns who went through a lot of difficulties. Some of them were on the verge of suicide, and yet they were able to pull themselves together and ultimately get awakening. That's encouraging. Any of the contemplations that you find encouraging and strengthening, you've got to learn how to develop them. And if there's that nagging voice in the back of the mind that says, well, that may be true of them, but it's not really true of me, you've got to recognize that voice for what it is. Something is unbeneficial. And only telling part of the truth. Maybe you have some weaknesses, but you've also got strengths. And don't let the cynic take over, because the cynic wants to destroy you, doesn't want to practice. It's that member of the committee that you can't allow to have any power. You've got to learn how to undermine its power so it doesn't get in the way of the strengthening exercises that we do as we practice, as we meditate, as we develop mindfulness, alertness, concentration, discernment. All of these things are meant to help us comprehend suffering so that we can understand how it comes, how it goes, and realize where the cause is. There may be a lot of causes coming from outside, but the things that really harm us, that really hurt us, are the ways we cause ourselves to suffer. And sometimes that's hard to admit to yourself, too, but so that's another reason why you need inner strength, so you can look at your own failings and not get knocked off course by them, not get overwhelmed by them. And partly it's helpful to realize everybody does this. Everybody's harming themselves, causing themselves suffering. The only people who aren't are our hunts. So we're all in this together. But we don't have to stay here. So the sense of accomplishment that comes when the mind can settle down, the sense of ease that comes, these are all things that help you look at the ways in which the unskillful members of your committee have been causing a lot of trouble. So one of the uses of the not-self teaching is learn how to disidentify with them, just watch them as on patterns of behavior, old conversations, old movies, old habits that you haven't had a real chance to look at carefully, but now you can. And we learn the imagination that tells you that you can think of other ways of dealing with a particular problem, that you don't have to make yourself suffer. It's when you see that the type of behavior you're doing is causing yourself suffering, and the fact that it's not necessary, there are alternatives. That's when you can really let go. But this requires patience, it requires endurance, it requires self-confidence. So any perceptions that help in that project of giving you more strength, those are the ones you want to hold on to. Those are the ones you want to develop. So 
So you have the confidence that, like a John Munn and his John Munn students, you can do it too. After all, they were human beings, but a lot of strikes against them, but they were able to take to heart the fact that they were suffering and they were causing themselves to suffer. And the path to the end of suffering is something everybody can follow. 